everyone and welcome back. So today we're going to be doing a video on eating disorders from the parents' perspective. So would you like to introduce yourselves guys? Who wants to Hi, go? I'm John. I'm Megan's dad. Hi, I'm Tracy. I'm Megan's mum, business owner, hip supporter, um, taxi driver. <laughs> <laughs> Just the typical things mums like to do. So we'll just get right into the questions. So the first question is, what were your first thoughts about my eating disorder? Totally shocked. Yeah, I think you kind of feel um, you don't have any control because obviously as a parent, you you know, you're there to um, keep your child safe. But with an eating disorder, I mean, it's completely out of your hands. Um, and it's a com completely. Unexpected. It's frustrating. Um, yeah, unexpected. Did they think it was going to happen to us? Mm -hmm. uh, was it anything that we had done? Um, so all those thoughts kind of go through your head. Okay, do you have anything else you'd like to add to that? No. Um, what are the first signs that someone has an eating disorder? Weight loss. Personality change. Um, I think I first noticed when I used to make pieces for lunch for about three months. And I noticed the weight loss he was going through and then the personality change and eating a lot of chewing gum and eating slowly at meal times. I think that was the total key. That was a we need to get Megan checked out so we took you to the doctors. But obviously he didn't know that at the time. Yeah, um, obviously Dad had heard you've been sick. Um, first time, yeah, you're not too sure. Um, then there was comments from people saying, oh, Megan's lost a bit of weight. And I think because when you live with somebody, you don't notice it as much. Whereas when people are coming in and out of the home and they've maybe not seen Megan for a little bit, then they get to notice it. Um, and so then he's start to concentrate on what she's doing, cutting the food up into tiny pieces as well and just taking a tiny little bit, but eating it slowly as well. Um, so, and then obviously the se after the second time um, we heard her being sick, we're like, no, it's, there's definitely something wrong here. Um, so this kind of falls into that. There is a question that says, how did your parents not know that you were starving yourself? But as you have both said, you knew right away, like you did not not know mm -hmm. um, about that. Yeah, was totally well, you had a pain in your rib, um, so I used that as an excuse to take you to the doctors. Yeah. Um, so you were quite shocked um, yeah. when I brought it up with the doctor and I said, look, the reason we're actually here is that we've heard Megan being sick a couple of times, noticed a few changes in her weight, her eating habits, um, um, we think obviously this could be leading to something a little bit more serious. Um, even the doctor was very emotional, very helpful, um, and it was great to have that kind of support for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we got the paediatrician as well at the health centre, um, and he was absolutely fantastic with Megan. Um, so that was the first steps. Yeah. Um... There is a question that kind of relates to that one also, was did your parents help you get support, which you have said that that was the case. You were yeah. the ones that yeah. took me to get the help. Um, well, obviously the doctor then puts you in touch yeah. for the next step, so then it gets you put, put in touch with CAMS. Oh. They've then got to do an assessment. There's lots of different stages, and it's waiting list upon waiting list. Um, but obviously because of the severity of Megan's illness by the time she got seen by CAMS, they rushed everything through. Yeah, because wasn't it not like a week after the initial assessment that they wanted me to see a psychiatrist? It was yeah. quite yeah. quick. Was quite and quick. we were like, quite well, quick. that was mm -hmm. really fast because that's when there is... We kept getting told there was going to be waiting lists. Um, so we thought for Willow Grove, which is the kind of day therapy day, unit, uh, day we thought, um, they, they said there's no, real, there's no spaces, there'll be a waiting list, but within a day we were told, well, actually Megan... Megan can go here, there's a space opened up for her. Mm -hmm. And then even 
you were only there a day when you had to actually go into hospital. Yeah. Do you have anything you'd like to add to that? No. No? Um, Hayley would like to know how you both felt through it all and what effect it had on both of you. Um, I think it was just a sheer pressure because you're a parent, you make to look after your kid and you just feel helpless. Too many grey areas from a man's perspective. And my perspective is, is things have to be in black and white. I don't like grey areas. And with an eating disorder, there is too many grey areas. And I just couldn't hope. To be fair, I just couldn't. But, yeah. Yeah, no, it was um, obviously got two other children, Molly and Lucy. Lucy was just a toddler as well, so you still got, you know, you're, you're looking after Megan, you've got your school runs, you've got a toddler who is into everything. And she was, like, <laughs> so into everything. I had just started running um, my own business as well. Um, Molly looking up at Megan, a big sister. So it, it, was, Molly. it was stressful. For just like even just normal daily routines, um, but yeah, as a parent, you just you you know your dad said to feel helpless. Um, you kind of start to doubt yourself as a parent as well, mm. wondering did I do something wrong? Um, you then think about the kids that have bullied you, um, and. The fact that they're still just walking about normal lives at school, getting their education, mm. they're happy, healthy, um, and just from comments and things that they've made to you and put on social media, that's now the way you are. Um, and nothing's been done with the kids that have actually caused it. Mm -hmm. um, Hayley would also like to know how you think it affected um, my siblings, so Molly and Lucy. I think it affected because I think Molly at that time she looked up to you because obviously you were the big sister and she probably didn't understand why you were in hospital, why your mum, me and mom, your mum were actually sitting with you, had to sit and watch you eat, encourage you to eat, sit after half an hour so you wouldn't do exercises just so you can burn off calories and, and obviously having a telly. I don't know if that was my fault, but or mum's or both her faults, so they bring a tail down to this and distract you so you could eat. So Molly tried to do the same with an iPad and yeah, I had a, a, a big impact on the whole member of the family, um, to be fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think now you now see the effects on Molly kind of now, she's getting older, but at the time, um, Molly just was getting on with everything. Um, because the attention was focused on you, attention was focused on Lucy because she was just a, a riot, still is a riot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, and Molly just seemed like she was cool with everything and getting on with it, but obviously it probably she was wasn't. Good. So because it seemed like she was coping with it, you, you thought, oh, this is great because this is, you know, Molly's just moving along with everything. And, mm. But obviously she wasn't in we obviously took our eye off the ball with that one. Um, so how do you feel like you supported me? I thought we could have done what, what any parent would do through the circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, could we have done more? Probably not. Drink cams, could have done more? Definitely. I think that's where we got left to our own devices. It's the actual daycare or the aftercare. Um, we had a couple of nurses coming out of the house twice or three times a week just to keep an eye on things. Um, I don't know, it's just... But you've covered me, so I don't probably go over that, that, that bit. Oh, well. <laughs> um, no, I think it would, there's probably things when you look back we probably could have done, could have done better because it is very frustrating so you, you kind of lose it a bit and have a meltdown. Um, we didn't but, have an under, a good understanding of it. 
Well, to like, know. nobody does, and, you know, your friends, you know, some friends and... And family even, that you know, that didn't understand it either. Mm. Um, and we didn't go about it the best of ways that would then cause problems for yeah. you guys. Yeah, in the because you've got... Um, and say things yeah. that and you were just like... Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I think we probably, you know, we followed everything that we were told and given. Um, we oh, kept you awesome. safe. When, when we could, obviously we'll probably touch on, on that later, but um, I just think, um, you know, I think we, as parents we supported you. Um, there's the hospital visits, the hospital meetings, um, and making sure that you were at everything. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, as I say, probably look back and there's probably things that we maybe could have done different, things we, we could have said differently. Um, because that's mind blowing. Because you're so used to just saying things, but then you're having to think about what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just, and then you're like, oh no, did I just say that? Or <laughs> yeah, um, I agree. I think you did the best that you could have done with what you were given. Um, because I feel like you could have been given much more resources to help you along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, so I agree with everything that you're saying. I think calms. Um, they were just more like solely focus on you and to a certain extent I agree but then there was no really any backup plan for us how we were all meant to pull in the same direction work together work together yeah I thought like it was all about you know, we can't do nothing it's, it's all about me and well that's fine but we need to learn how to do it and there was nothing like that mm -hmm. and we were just basically I think Made up as we go along. Yeah. Um. So, did um you feel that you acted differently around me? Yes. Definitely. Yeah, I definitely could feel that you were always tr walking on eggshells, always thinking about what you were trying to say, and then getting frustrated because you realised you said something you shouldn't have said, and then trying to backtrack and try and make it right. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely felt that you were acting different around me, but looking back on it now, I understand now why that was the case. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll let you away with murder sometimes. Well, what, yeah. one of us would, and another one would get frustrated with it, yeah. and then it would be rever <laughs> rules reverse. Yeah. <laughs> well, be me then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, kind of, this question leads into something of what you said. So. It's kind of two questions into one, um, but I will ask one at a, like one part yeah. at a time. So, how did you feel my experience with being in the inpatient unit was? To me first. If you want to go first. Um, I th thought that would probably would probably make it you actually look better in the in inpatients. To be fair, I thought you were making strides. Within a short space of time. And I think when he came out, he kind of went back. I don't know if that was due to us or the circumstances or left to your own devices or what, I've no idea. But we are in the hospital, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Obviously, all mental health is completely underfunded. Um, so even the inpatient unit was understaffed. Um, but the one thing in the whole of this, regardless of inpatient, outpatient, is communication. And it was always was, poor. It was very, very bad. We've asked Megan. We've asked Megan this. We've asked Megan that. I was only 14 at the time. Yeah, yeah. so you were... A minor. You, you weren't an adult. I weren't an adult. Weren't and an adult. I was clearly, was clearly was not in the right place of yes. mind to make decisions about my own care, especially mm -hmm. for me to be in that position in the first place. There was no way that I was able to make the positive decisions that I needed to for my own care. So they should not have been asking me, because I wasn't. I also wasn't a very good communicator at that point. So I definitely don't feel. I feel like they should have obviously prioritised asking you guys. Yeah. yeah with that. But the the never will. And really I had, that, I used to go to the hospital meetings, and it would be me, and a room full, of people from the hospital, doctors, 
um, visitors. Psychiatrist, you name it, and little old me. Um, Intimidated. And I'm saying to them, communication. Oh, okay, we'll make a note for it. And it, it, never, it never changed anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, you were in Edinburgh, so. It's a bit of a check from yeah. West London. So it'd be like, can you come in for a meeting? Um, I don't know, it was just, it was all very bizarre. One trained. Um, I mean, the inpatient unit was, was it a nice place and the rest of it, but even like the day you were coming home, we walked in and they were saying, oh, Megan's coming home today. Did you not know, think to tell us? Because we might have actually wanted to make sure Megan's room was all nicely done for her, made it feel really welcome in. Um, we, can, we could get the other two kids organised for that happening. Um, so and, you know, and sit down and talk to them. But it was all very kind of... Everything was all last minute. Or on their terms rather yeah. than oh. communicating to make sure it was okay with you mm-hmm. guys. And it's like when you used to get your weight done that, oh, we'll need to ask Megan if we can tell you that. Sorry. That's bizarre. You have a right to know that information. Well, that's what we thought, but no, no. Mm-hmm. And especially asking someone with an eating disorder if you can tell them their weight, they're obviously going to say no. Mm-hmm. Um, and they would always get you to tell us, but, I mean... You can be scatty at the best of times. Yeah. <laughs> for things. Honestly. But I mean, with eating disorder, you know, you just didn't remember half the stuff, so you can even tell us. And then we go and ask, oh, is Megan okay? Well, I need to check with Megan if we can tell you this. Mm-hmm. And to this day, I don't remember a lot of the things that happened because it was like of the type of experience it was. It's like my brain kind of blocks it out. So mm-hmm. That's why I thought it'd be good to get your... I think the community. only thing that probably kept us in the loop with was when they had to put, insert the feeding tube. Yeah. And the doctor called me first and he said, this is what we're going to have to do. Um, without it, you know, it could be quite dire for Megan. Yeah. Um, so we're going to ask for her permission first to insert the tube, but if not, we will have to come back to you to get your permission. Mm-hmm. Which is all, it was daunting because you're thinking, yeah. oh, I'm gonna ha- she's going to hate us. But we've got to do it because you want to keep her alive. Mm-hmm. Um, so the relief when he came back and said that you'd agree yeah, to that. I think <laughs> it was the thought of being sectioned. But if I didn't agree, was the fear that made me agree on my own. So I was like, mm-hmm. I don't want to be here longer than I have to be. So I'll just do what I have to do kind of thing. Yeah. And I mean, they did invite us in at the inpatients and help us with meal plans and, you know, and how they talk to you yeah. when you were having your food. So, so that, that was, was good. good but again, it's out with mm-hmm. your normal situation and there's no help in how to, for you to deal with that as a family. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And just to follow on to that, it was how do you think I was supported with Willow Grove and outpatient care with like the nurses that would come out of the house. Well, this is a bit where I'm just going to go ratchet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's where it uh, all fell apart. Yeah. Obviously, we had um, we had the first nurse that came out. I literally cannot remember her Was name. Was it not like Belinda or something like that? Oh, I really can't remember. I honestly don't remember at all. And I really liked her at first and she was very soft spoken. She was kind of old school. Um, she had a quite nice way about her, I thought, at the time. Um, until we had been offered um, the family ther- group oh, therapy. Oh yeah, this is where it all goes downhill. <laughs> and what they wanted us to do, which I thought, oh great, there's going to, they're going to help us. But they wanted us to go to Willow Grove. Mm-hmm. So they wanted to take us out of our house, our home environment, which is where you eat, with a two-year-old. How old were you? Eight at the time? Eight. Yeah. Eight at the time. Um, now, Lucy would not have sat. She would have been absolutely running about the place, looking at stuff and the rest of it. They wanted us to bring food as yeah, well and, cook, and, yeah. cre- and cook the meal there. And it was to see how we interacted as a family at meal times and how we did things. Basically, they were setting you up to fail. Because if they set you up to fail, then they can tell you what you're supposed to do. But for me, I thought, well, actually, that's they should be coming to the house because that is our environment. Mm-hmm. That's where we need 
the help with on meal times mm -hmm. and the rest of it. And Lucy's in that environment, so she's going to sit, she's going to do what she does at dinner time and Molly. So why not come out and give us help in our home? Mm -hmm. Don't set us up to fail so you can turn around and be, oh, this great almighty and tell us what we're supposed to be doing and what we're doing wrong and the rest of it. That's not really supporting us. No. We just want some guidance in how to look after our daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, when she say, she came in, the nurse, after I had cancelled the group the family therapy, because I said, I'm sorry, but it actually isn't going to help. For me, I don't see how that's helping us. Mm -hmm. I'm probably in some big picture in somebody's mind that does help. Um, but she, she turned to me and she said... I can't believe you cancelled it. And I said, well, why not? It's not set up to help us in any shape or form in our home environment. If Megan had cancer, would you have cancelled? Like, those are So she was severely told where the door was. Um, and by then I said to them, look, don't send her back to the house. Not having her here. Um, so we ended up getting a guy who I quite liked. John didn't. Um, he did all the kind of things where you delve into what kind of animal you are. Um, what were you again, John? A raging bull. Because you were a raging bull. You had so much anger, anger, uh -huh. and just not knowing. I how was a kangaroo because I wasn't really kind of letting Megan. Because she's the first. You know, no, you can't do that. You can't go there. <laughs> so I had to kind of loosen the apron strings a little bit. <laughs> yeah. um, so I was the kangaroo. John obviously didn't like him at all. Um, oh, and no, they I clashed. Did, you know, I, I did like him until he came out with this. I'm like, what is he was quite a, He was quite a good looking dude. What? Is that what? Craig Sell, the, um, the daycare centre, and, and what was the doctor's name? Which Dr. one? Dr. Hamid. Dr. Hamid? Uh, uh, I don't know if we should be exposing their names on YouTube, but okay. Sometimes I just wanted to. Uh, I. Stick a rock right up his backside came. because he until was. I mean, I suppose it's got to be his way cool, calm, but I thought, oh my god, if you actually talk any slower, oh. I'm going to be slain soon. It was, it was just so lackadaisical about things. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we had, you know, we had to watch because of self-harm. Yeah. Um, suicide attempts. And that night, obviously, you locked yourself from the bathroom. And Dad had to kind of break the door down. Because mm -hmm. to make sure. And then, as Dad was coming through the door, the door kind of knocked you. And then what you had just explained the kind of situation, they made it into something completely oh, they different. Extra, like made it to be a this really severe situation, more severe than what that's, actually was. That's when like they, Dad had assaulted you or something yeah. and the relationship was, deteriorated. And then he phoned you and he says, oh, I'll have to ask the question. And Megan's going, but that's not what I said to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um so there were because they were like basically that. trying to insinuate just, that something bad had happened that they'd have to get social services involved when that was not the case at all because they would just ex they kind of exaggerated that situation to kind of fit their own narrative yeah but then obviously we had four attempts on your life um every time i called to tell them that obviously you're taking tablets or whatever, um, like onto the NHS outpatients to see if we needed an ambulance, if we had to take you to the hospital. The first question they would ask when I told them about your eating disorder, what is Megan's weight? Didn't they have a clue? Because in no, Willow us. Grove, it was all, oh, well, we'll need to see if Megan will let us tell you. Well, I'm sorry, but... How can I care for my child and keep her safe if I don't even know what her weight is? So I'm having to ask Megan. Megan's going, oh, I think it was. 
because our weight and how many tablets she took depend um, was dependent on whether or not they would have to see her yes. and how it was going to affect our, our system. So um, it's just all that. It's the communication. Their communication is very poor. I know they're underfunded. I know they're understaffed. But at the end of the day, these are our kids' lives yeah. um, that they're dealing with. We're their parents. We're, we're the carers for them. So give us the information so that when things like that happen, we can be there and we can be responsive and we know the information. I look like a fool. I'm our mother and I actually don't even know the answer to these questions. Yeah. And so that basically could be like a point to put to them and say, you know, you should be telling us this information because if something like this were to happen, we need to know this information just so that we can actually look out for them. Mm -hmm. Um, so this question kind of goes into that question. So did you feel you were properly supported in hospital from treatment and also patient care and family care, which you said? Yeah, you the did. hospital care, definitely. Outdoor care, probably not. On the surface to people, it probably looked like we were getting the care because you had your Willow Grove, you had the nurse coming in. I also had psychologist. But that's, Aye, that's all okay. Oh, yeah. But... And that was all for you, and that's that's what it's there yeah. for. But there's nothing like the communication to us and how we can help you, um, and for us as a family, because I think the impact that it has on a family as a whole it's is quite unreal. That is frightening. Mm -hmm. And there isn't any support for that. There's no guidance. There's no. And and it should be and um, it should be about you, but there should be something as well yeah, that helps. Family. And that family therapy, I'm sorry, but wasn't even worth the paper it was written on. Mm -hmm. So your advice is for them is to basically reevaluate their family yeah. therapy so uh, that families can uh, be supported uh, uh, in a better situation. Mm -hmm. And just communicate with the, yeah. the parents and the family and and let them have a better understanding of what their child's going through, what they're dealing with. There's going to be things you're going to say that they can't tell, and I'm I'm okay with that. But things like your weight, just basic, simple things. Mm -hmm. I don't think, for me personally, I don't think the doctors should really tell the kid that's got an eating disorder. This is the yeah. thing I don't understand. Yeah, because you some... struggled with that sometimes. Yeah. Why? They, they why did give tell... you the option to know, <sighs> well, but no. obviously with someone who has an eating disorder, even if they didn't want to know, they'll still ask because that's what's fueling ah. their disorder in so a way, it's the just... part of it. Um, and a lot of the time that would kind of put me back a bit if I knew that I'd like gained weight or lost weight, that would play my mind a lot. Um, so I agree with the point that they shouldn't really give you the option to find out. Because see, if, if, I, if, I, if I didn't know, I feel like I probably could have recovered a lot quicker. A lot quicker. Um, obviously safely, um, but I feel like I wouldn't have had as much ups and downs. It would have been a wee bit more plain sailing. Um, I still would have found it difficult no, nonetheless, but I think it would have been a bit easier. Um, which is one thing you both found the hardest? Um... Try to deal with it on a day to day basis. Because every day was a, a different day in our school day. And yeah, it's just. Because we've got a family, we've got other two siblings to look after, and well, daughters, whatever. Um, just, yeah, it was just he, uh, uh, very heads on. Um. It was all difficult. I think probably the feeding tube for me was probably the hardest. Um, and just seeing how frail you were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And knowing that I couldn't do anything to, to make that better. Mm -hmm. Being a parent, that's it. Yeah. So, how do you think you could have been supported more throughout the five years I was with CAMS? <sighs> Communication is the key. Uh, communication. They need to learn to communicate with families, not just the patients, and give them the information that they need in order to help you. I think maybe, you know, we got invited to some groups with other parents. They were all through in Edinburgh. I started at six o'clock. 
well, we had no child, we had nobody to watch the girls. Yes. So it meant one of us could only go. So the other person then misses out. Um, plus they're away through in Edinburgh, so you've got to leave it really early in order to beat all the traffic to get through there on time. Mm -hmm. um, it was just like everything, it just sometimes it felt like everything was just set up against us. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, communication and more kind of family therapy, but that helps families in their own environment. Yeah. Because everybody's situation is different. Not everything works for everybody. You know, mm -hmm. siblings are all different as well. You know, if you've got to take that into consideration. Um, you know, it's just... But communication is the key. Yeah. Yeah. And they really need to build on that. 100%. So how do you feel I was supported from CAMS? Um, I thought you were pretty good. You were looked after. Well, the attention was on you, obviously, for obvious reasons, but yeah, no complaints. Yeah, I think you got a bit frustrated sometimes with certain things, but um, mm -hmm. I think all in all there was a lot in place to help you, mm -hmm. um, which you've got to be the first priority anyway. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I don't think there's so much help though for you after coming out of hospital in the sense that you were in that hospital for six weeks and then you had to come back to reality mm -hmm. really and uh, that must have been quite daunting for you but I don't feel there was any kind of support. support there to kind of help you mm -hmm. make that transition because I definitely found that part the hardest because you know you're stuck in a hospital for six weeks confined to like this sort of one space and then you have to adjust to the the big world again um, and I think it would be a lot easier for people like see for example if they were going to Willow Grove or like a place like that which was like a day centre if they went if they gone there beforehand they went straight back into that because mm -hmm. then it was a sense of like familiar, familiar, how do you say that word? Familiar, what? Familiar, oh, I can't get it. Yeah, that <laughs> word. Um, like, it was familiar and it was also safe. Um, not that home isn't safe, but for the treatment side of things, I feel like that could have been a kind of safety point mm -hmm. for them to have done that, where it's like ease you back into going. Whereas I had to be adjusted to living at home, which is fine. But then I obviously needed outpatient care anyway, with, like, without the, the nurses being there. Um, what do your parents think was your turning point in recovery? Good question. I think possibly stagecoach. Ah, uh, stagecoach. Yeah. Oh, um, so. And that's all thanks to Gavin, who obviously I was doing some work for. And he understood it because his sister had been through um, an eating disorder and I mean she lit the doctors basically said they could do no more for her but I mean she managed to turn her, her life around and recover um, so I think because he understood it as well mm -hmm. and he was obviously there on a Saturday when you went I think it built on your confidence oh, 100% your social skills again because you were yeah. having to build on them again yeah. um, and it gave you a different outlook um, mm -hmm. Which is obviously something that you've now gone on to, yeah, to, to pursue. Do. Yeah. So I've got, I mean, Gavin, I thank greatly for that, yeah, um, giving me that place. And um, I think you just thrived from that point. Yeah, I think everybody saw a big difference in you from them. Mm -hmm. You agree? Yeah, totally. Um, what do you think had the most impact in my recovery slash relapse? So we'll take it at one point at a time. So what do you think had the most impact in my recovery? Your weight, because every time they were telling you your weight, you used to then go eat again, and then you'd relapse. I think stagecoach helped greatly with your recovery. Mm -hmm. um, the meal plans didn't help a lot. Regimental. Um, I think, again, as well, it would be quite good to understand the thinking behind the meal plans yeah. because. Okay, probably the quantities that you're getting weren't huge, but it's not something that you would eat on a, 
a normal person would eat yeah. <laughs> on I'm a daily sure, basis. I'm sure it's to stop refeeding syndrome because if you feed someone who's underweight too fast, it can cause a lot of problems. I'm sure that's the reason behind it. But you'd probably have to do more research into it. That's just from my perspective. I'm sure yeah, they I mentioned that. that. They mentioned that. Quite yeah. Times. And I think sometimes you felt that, like, why am I having to eat all this? Yeah. You're not having that for your breakfast. Yeah, because it was like cereal, toast, and a banana or something. Uh-huh. Or like cereal, toast, and a yogurt or something like that. Um, yeah. Or And then if you, they felt that you weren't really gaining um, on one meal plan, then it would be putting you back to another. And that mentally as well, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think so. Definitely help, no. So what do you think had the most impact in my relapse? I think it was to actually, I don't know if it was getting told by your weight, I mean, that's why you relapse. And obviously, if you're coming out of the hospital, and being in the hospital for six weeks coming out, it's just a sheer fear, panic, no coping. So you relapse. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just psychological. I, I, I don't know if you maybe felt a pressure. Uh, I don't know. As well, because people one. think that you're recovered. There's that pressure. Because you don't you. see any scars, you're, you're, you're fine. Yeah. You look at somebody, you're, you're fine, but and mentally. And people then start changing their kind of, I don't know, you're going to hate this word, mindset. Because <laughs> how many times did that get mentioned? Honestly, yeah. that would drive me insane. <laughs> so because people thought you were recovered, they would then get back to maybe not watching what they were saying. Yeah. And it's just wee bits that were just maybe. Just kind of hitting you, oh, that's that word, that word's no good to me. Yeah, like, certain it was words. like, oh, you look well. Yeah. Or, um, what was the other one? Yeah. Or, are you, are you actually going to eat all of that? And mm-hmm. just like those sorts of things. Um, or people commenting, oh, you look like you've lost weight. Um, that would kind of get into my head too as well. Like, even though it wasn't a positive compliment, like it wasn't a compliment at all, my brain would kind of take it as a compliment and then it would kind of fuel it more, which is not what you want to do when someone's trying to recover. Because um, it doesn't help all these social media sites, which I didn't know until you pointed out, that there's people telling you how you have an eating disorder. Yeah, pro anna pro eating disorders, yeah. And they're very, it's very rife on like Tumblr. I don't use Tumblr anymore for one of those reasons. Um, and... All social media, really, there's all very pro eating disorders, which are very, like, they're actually disturbing. Mm -hmm. Like, how anyone could encourage another human being to get to that point is really horrible. It's really horrible. Um, If you could change anything about the process, what would it be? Communication. Communication. (laughs) Communication. I think I'd get a communication sponsorship deal like this. You maybe <laughs> could if anyone wants to hire up. Feel free. Was it record breakers? What was the guy's name? I have no idea. Because I can picture him as well. Roy. Uh, Roy Castle. Does that know what he says? I have no idea what, what that is. What was his song? Oh, there's a song. <laughs> Please don't sing, John. Oh, no. no. Um, so, <laughs> there's another question. How can parents best support their child if their child isn't willing to make the change themselves? Just got to encourage them. Just got to keep pushing forward and with encouragement. I think that's all you can, all one can do. Do what I did, lie while you're taking them to the doctors. <laughs> Yeah. Um. I mean, I remember when we came out of that and I was like, is your mum a bitch? And you went, yes. Yeah, I was so and shocked. you just cried. But then I think it was a bit of a relief for you as well. Mm. Yeah. Because somebody had actually taken it out of your hands. Yeah. I think so too. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, called old names. Yeah. So used to it. <laughs> Get in line. <laughs> no, but definitely because no one can help the child unless they're willing to help themselves is something that i've learned a lot throughout this whole process you can't get the help unless you're willing to change your behavior and your actions within that um so do you have any advice for parents or carers going through a similar situation kind of just any final last words before we end up this video here um i mean i think we'll probably help me in the long run was the fact that 
my auntie was going through the same thing, obviously, with my cousin. Um, and she then understood. And my uncle was go reacting in the same way as dad. So we could kind of, you know... We could help him. Talk about it. And she understood everything. I was saying, just actually having somebody there that actually understands. Mm. You know, you can have... You've Focal. got all these specialists and the rest of it because somebody's going to college, university to get a degree so that they can tell you all about eating disorders and the rest of it. But see, unless you're actually physically living through it, you literally have no idea. Because literally no idea. one person's situation can be completely totally different, different yeah. for someone else. Yes. Exactly. So if you've got if there's if you've got somebody that you know that can help, and I found when you actually put it on Facebook. Um, the amount of people that came forward saying, oh my God, I had no idea that you were even going through any of that. Um, and then you would hear a story or two similar situation as they've been through. So that is all we've got time for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you have any more questions that you would like to ask in the comments, feel free and I will make sure that they can answer them for you. So thank you guys for coming on and talking about this today. I felt like it was very informative. Yes, Did it you was. enjoy yes. your time? Yes. Yes. And yeah, honestly, I'm writing um, a book about it as well. Yes, and how it I cannot wait to read. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's certainly helped my book as well. Yeah, no, definitely. Self-promo. Yes. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.